Good morning, I'm Steve Rosansky, President and CEO of the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to our January Government Affairs Committee meeting. Um, we've been on hiatus a little bit with our Government Affairs Committee meeting, and so I'm glad to be bringing this uh, program back in the new year. We've got a, a great uh, two speakers, as it turns out, this morning, and uh, Alberto will be introducing uh, them uh, shortly. Um, the program today is on the new uh, residential a uh, trash uh, program that was just uh, approved by the city council. Um, and uh, we'll find out how that came to, to be, I believe probably through um, Dave uh, when he gives his presentation. Uh, Dave uh, has a hard stop at 8.30, but has um, his uh, co coworker, uh, Micah Martin, who is actually in charge of the, uh, the rollout of the program will stay on with us. So if you have any questions uh, about the uh, residential trash program, uh, please put them in the Q&A box. We'll be monitoring the Q&A box for questions. Please don't put it in the chat box, okay? And so uh, that being said, uh, we're sorry we couldn't meet in person. Um, we thought it was prudent to uh, move this uh, meeting onto Zoom again uh, until the numbers uh, with the coronavirus uh, come down a little bit. Oh, there's Mike again. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna turn this over to Alberto to introduce uh, Dave and we'll get on with our program. So take it away, Alberto. Well, good morning, everyone. And thanks for joining us this morning. Dave, special welcome to you for uh, taking the time out and Micah as well uh, to share some important details on what's going on in the city of Newport. Uh, I can tell you uh, from personal experience, uh, our neighborhood just uh, changed over to the new system of trash cans and uh, my boy, who is uh, charged with having to take that out to the curb is always asking questions. So uh, you got 13 year olds asking questions. Anyway, welcome. Uh, let me do a quick introduction of you. Dave Webb currently serves as the director of public works for the city of Newport Beach and has over 30 years of experience. Dave oversees the city's $74 million capital improvement program, civil and transportation engineering, public right of way development, and permitting, capital project construction and inspection, traffic and signal system operations, surface water quality compliance and conservation, and municipal maintenance operation. You never sleep, Dave, do you? No, we're busy. Prior, prior to being promoted to director of public works for the city in August of 2012, he served as the city's deputy director of public works and city engineer for five years. Before coming over to Newport, Dave served the residents of Huntington Beach for 16 years as city engineer and deputy director of public works over utilities and maintenance operations. Mr. Webb earned a master's degree in public administration from Cal State Long Beach, go Beach, as well as a bachelor of science degree in civil engineering from Cal Poly Pomona. Go Broncos, right? Broncos. He's also licensed as a registered professional civil engineer in California. Dave, welcome. Thanks for joining us uh, this morning at our Government Affairs Committee. Thanks, Alberto. It's great to be here today. And again, I want to point out also with me today is Micah Martin. He's our Deputy Director of our Municipal Operations. Um, and he's really uh, the heavy lifter of this program, but I, I'll take the opportunity to go through today. And I'm going to I'm going to have to go off, as uh, Steve mentioned, but I will surely, Mike is going to stay around for any questions. This is a big discussion. It's been going on a long time, very important discussion. So I've got a presentation today. I'm going to pull that up and um, get that going for you. And Alberta, can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. So we're going to jump into this and I'll walk through this and I... I Please apologize for the format. Probably the best way is that we go through the whole presentation and then we'll take your questions. I know there's lots. We just uh, had a large presentation that Micah gave at the city council meeting where they actually adopted the new residential contract uh, last week on the 11th of January. Um, so, and we've been discussing this for some time with the community and we're happy to come out if you're an HOA or business out there and you represent an organization, we're happy and come out and talk about it because there's a lot of details here. There's a lot of change that's gonna be happening. Um, so let's jump in. So what's driving all this uh, this change? And again, I, I mentioned change. I, I always 
I'm patient with that word because most people are uncomfortable with some level of change. We're going to probably have more change than others because we've had an old system that we've been using for quite some time. It's served us well, kind of a single barrel system where you just put everything in and, and then we take care of it on the other side. But way back before 2000, uh, the state really kind of got aggressive in trying to reduce the, the amount of material going to landfills. And they started more on the side of trying to, re we were running out of landfill space. We had to uh, reduce the volume going there. Also, it was a good idea to recycle. So this graph here, kind of shows where we started on the legislation back in AB 939. By the year 2000, we were supposed to be doing 50% recycling. Um, and it seems like a long time ago. I, I remember moving to the Arbor Linda in 1990. I had three cans we were recycling then, but um, 2000 really got it kicked off. Then there's a series of legislation that required commercial recycling. Then they brought in commercial organics a little later on. Um, and then we'll talk a little later on about alternative cover. They, they changed the law on that. And then just recently, uh, SB 1383 really has been driving it is where we have to bring in residential recycling of organics. Uh, and that actually started and has to be in place of January 1 this year. So a lot of pressure to do this. So how did the city address this? Um, we have a lot of refuge programs throughout the city at different levels. So the city council established a, a, what they call a council working group. And we put three council members on there. That was council member O'Neill, council member Dixon and council member Brenner. And they started looking at all the various programs with staff. We brought on an expert uh, consultant in the world of um, uh, refuge and recycling. We had some attorneys on board and reading the legislation um, and developing the codes. And we methodically started going through all the different contracts and areas of refuge in the city. And this kind of shows it, but we had to touch our own contracts. The city has several on itself. If you think about those trucks that pick up trash on the beach, the ones that pick up trash on the cans around the city, all our facilities need recycle or re, uh, refuge collection. So those contracts were addressed, rebid, uh, reformatted to address the new law. We also had to change them. The municipal code reflect these new law requirements. Um, we then went to our commercial franchises. Those are the folks that pick up on a private basis, the restaurants, the businesses around, and we had to upgrade their franchises, change the, the language in there so they had the proper reporting in there, proper recycling, proper things they had to do, along with adding things like some safety upgrades, uh, collision avoidance equipment requirements in there. We, we did that, went through that. Those are all in place. And in the meantime, we started conducting outreach with businesses, kind of like this format. We've gone to uh, educational areas uh, and trying to just educate people, one, on the new laws and the changes that are coming about. Um, the city has a small recycling fee that was uh, last updated in 2009. We had to go back and look at that, uh, updated with the requirements and, and the fee levels. Um, and so that was done. And we had an unusual area we down in the Babo Village area. We have a joint uh, where the city runs a joint uh, uh, bin closure for the uh, businesses there because it's just so tight down there, no place to have their own uh, bins. They actually, so we kind of brought it together and have our own uh, joint bin down there, but we run that, we had to upgrade that. And then lastly, the big challenge was the residential solid waste contract. We started that uh, discussion uh, and really got into that. So that's what we're gonna talk more about today. And then again, going forward, we're gonna continue to monitor, to educate. We're gonna have adjustments going forward. Not everything works the first time or it fits the first time. So look for that. So with regard to the residential side, it has its own unique set of problems. So when, when the working group started looking at this, we, first we had to address the fact that we have a split commercial and residential system here. Um, some cities have one trash hauler for all their haulage, one franchise hauler, and they do residential and commercial. We don't, we have an open commercial site. We have a number of uh, folks who wanna haul commercial. And then we have a, a sole proprietor uh, residential side. Uh, our collection space is different from some cities. We have very confined spaces, as you know, uh, much different than say my town of Mission Bay or um, uh, Irvine or something where they don't really have alleys, old streets, tight constrained areas. That, that requires a different type of collection. You're probably familiar with the, the truck going down the road and they call it a side loader where it lifts the new cans and puts them over. But you can't do that in an alley space because you've got utilities overhead, you only have a 10 foot wide alley. So we had to address those kind of things too. Um, organics were no longer allowed as alternative cover. And I mentioned that legislation that came along. This was a big changer because what they used to do is all the organics in, in the case of Newport, basically that's your mowing trimmings, your leaves, your branches all got thrown in your black cart. It was taken off to what we call a dirty murph, sorted out. And that organic material was allowed to be taken to the landfill held aside. Landfills are required by 
law every night to cover the trash. And of course, it's a good idea. You don't want that open trash. It causes vector problems, rodents, smells and stuff. So at the end of the day, when they're done dumping all the trash and compacting it, they put a layer of soil on top, usually six to eight inches of uh, soil to cover it every day. Well, that also takes up a lot of volume. So what they found was if they just took all the green waste aside, stuck it on the side, and at night they covered the trash with that, it really reduced all that uh, smell and other problems. So that's what they called alternative cover. But the law changed uh, back in 2020 that you could no longer do that, basically, because they wanted to take that green waste out and recycle it. But it also caused another problem, because when we use that green waste to cover the, the landfill, we got credit as recycled material. It was doing a purpose. But they took the diversion credits away, too, so our recycled numbers would go down on that. So there's some complica complications we had to deal with in that. Also that fact I mentioned, a dirty MRF, and let me explain what a MRF is. It's a material recovery facility. That's where your trash goes when it leaves your black can, goes in a truck and they take it to a place. It's basically a processing plant where they try to sort out the recyclables, in this case, uh, green waste and other things, so they can try to recover some of that. Why do we call it a dirty MRF? Because everything in your black can is just thrown in there. So your, your dry waste, your pizza boxes, your oil, your, you shouldn't have oil, by the way, but, you know, uh, some gets in there, uh, yard waste, pet waste, uh, anything like that, uh, glass, broken bottles, everything goes in there. And then when it goes to the MRF, they can only take out so much to a dirty MRF. Um, the recovery rate would be probably on average about 35% uh, recyclables come out of your dirty MRFs. But that's being phased out with the new laws. They got to go to other means to get higher levels of recyclables. So that also drives uh, the Newport problem because we're on a dirty MRF system with a single barrel. Um, also in our in our town, this, this thought of unlimited refuge services, uh, available residents, that was something the council working group and we looked at extensively. The, the municipal code and the charter about uh, free refuge to residential doesn't say unlimited. It, it really talks about, you know, your typical average waste. And I think we'll show later, we'll talk about some of the concerns that came out of that. But um, it generates a lot of material uh, and probably unfairly to the average person. Some people really generate a lot. So we had more state regulatory emphasis on curbside source. And what that is basically separating at the curb versus us doing it mechanically later. We need to get higher diversion rates. And again, that's that back to that dirty MRF because it doesn't produce that level of high diversions due to contamination. And, and basically, when we added the organics, which has to be separated out, um, that really started requiring a third cart system, which we'll talk about. You can't really recycle uh, green waste in a black cart because once you get a broken bottle or something in that green waste, it can't be recycled. It can't be turned into compost. It has to go to the landfill. So it needs to be in a separate system. So going back a little also on a residential system, we, had, we inherited uh, some built-in issues. Um, this slide here shows basically, if you look at this blue area here, this is the original city area, we call it the city contract uh, that we collected, as you, some of you might remember, the city forces used to do this for a long time, up to about 2010, then we switched over to contract services, um, and then CRNR took that over, but that had a certain set of rules and contract requirements in the franchise. When the city annexed Newport Coast up here in the green, it came in with its own contract and it had its own set of uh, circumstances and rules, and they didn't necessarily match the, the city contract. And then another part of the city up here in Santa Ana Heights, for those who, who are in this area, you know you have a separate uh, refuge collector up here. It's not even collected by the city. It's collected by the uh, Costa Mesa Sanitary District. Uh, and they have their own set of rules and necessarily don't apply the same to the, the city contract. So one of our goals was obviously we wanted to clean this up. Um, on those systems, if you recall, uh, right now I just mentioned that uh, the city system basically had a black can, which everything would be put in and taken to a dirty MRF for processing. Organics were put in that black can and were really hard to separate out. Um, and then the blue can system we have was purely voluntary under the last contract. Um, and that caused uh, some concerns. Our recycle rates were not as high as they should be. Um, the good news on that is we're going to make that mandatory now, and, and now, as of today, everybody in the city has a blue can, a recycle can, so we're going to actually be able to raise those percentages up. On the Newport Coast side, they had uh, their own system, and, and you can see in the picture here, they had a brown can versus a blue can. Still do, and that'll be eventually changed out to blue cans as they phase out. Um, the state law actually requires certain colors now be instituted for the organics in various cans. 
but they had a black can that went to the directly to the landfill and they had brown recycle that went to a clean work because they separated out their dry recyclables. But again, their recycle rates were rather low, a lot to do with, they have a lot of organics, you know, up in Newport coast, big uh, green areas. And so a lot of that was just going to landfill, which brings that reduction down. So the council working group started looking at the residential contract and, and knowing they need to change that, they put some things they really wanted to get uh, in place with the new contract. We wanted to make sure we ensure that, that we have a contract surely in place that the residential refuge is collected. That's important. We continue continuity of having a contract with a uh, collector. We want to ensure that the new contract was in compliance with the current state laws. And even there's some out there we see coming, we want to prepare for that so it doesn't cause a lot of change later. Let's take care of it now. I mentioned the two contracts, we wanted to merge those together. So we end up having the same terms. We're talking about the same reporting. There's a lot of background work that goes with it. The city staff has to report um, and having two versus one uh, causes problems and two different rules for groups. So we want to bring those together. And then we want to implement new uh, improved means and methods. And what I'm talking about that, I'm talking about maybe automation and other things that uh, produce a faster route, safer routes, recyclables, uh, better cleaning of recyclables, higher percentages, things like that, that we could do uh, as we have a chance to change. And then again, managing and minimizing program costs. We're gonna talk a little bit about this. I mentioned that as, as you're aware, residents in Newport Beach don't get charged a refuge bill. Uh, that's kind of unusual. There's a couple places I know that do. I think San Diego still does it, but most cities have a, a refuge bill sent out by the uh, refuge uh, provider, uh, like I do in Mission Viejo, I pay monthly, but we don't in this city. But that doesn't mean costs aren't important because on the back end, you're paying it un indirectly. Any, any costs we spend on excess on refuge is money taken away from the general fund that could be placed in police service, it could be library services, it could be potholes on roads. So it's important to manage those costs from a city standpoint. The council uh, working group worked a lot on this. And then again, we want to minimize the impact of residents. We, we know there's a lot of change in this program. Uh, we, we have to modernize. We haven't changed this specific program in a long time. So, But there is some impact and we want to try to minimize that. So where, where is this new program going? The, the, con, the council looked at this, approved the contract uh, on the 11th of this month, and what it's basically going to is a three-card system. And this is, it's interesting, we're catching up to the, the rest of the county uh, that's already kind of here. I remember, again, I mentioned when I was in Yorba Linda in 1990, I moved in. I had three carts back then when I moved to Mission Viejo in 20, uh, 2000, I had three carts. Uh, and Newport was on basically a one cart, black cart system. Most of the county is already here. So we're kind of catching up to that. Um, and, and we'll work through that. We're going through the, we'll talk more about that, but uh, it is a bit of a change. And uh, again, 75% of the people had blue carts before we started now, 100% do. So a lot of them are already there. We're going to come up with a new card system soon. So you, each resident will have a, a blue card and that's basically now required. And that's for your dry recyclables. You're gonna put in your paper, your products. When I say dry, it doesn't have to be completely dry, but you know, relatively dry. Empty out your plastic bottles and things of fluids and then throw them in there. If there's some moisture, that's fine. But that's, that's really what the recycled blue card is. We're gonna be adding a green card. This is the third card. That's gonna be your green waste. That's gonna be your leaves and your grass trimmings. If your gardener's there, he could dump that in there after he's done with your lawn, um, if you're doing your own. It also includes another thing, food waste. Uh, the state requires us to, to now recycle that. So food scraps and things uh, will now go in your green card. And then lastly, you'll still have a black card. Um, that black card will be just basically trash. Anything in the black card is going to go directly now to a landfill. It won't go to the recycling plan or anything. It's just basically stuff that can't be recycled. Now, it's important to note, and a question comes up a lot to us about, gosh, what am I going to do with these cards? Remember, you generated a certain amount of waste to begin with, uh, let's say last year. In this year, you're generating about the same amount of waste outside some of the changes about Amazon and how we process things. But you, you have about the same volume. It's just how you put it in your carts now. So we've been working with residents who used to have like four black carts, and now they're going to get a blue and a green. Technically, they'll probably end up with four carts. They need to remove a couple black carts because you'll find you're not putting as much in those anymore. You're putting it in your blue cart and your green cart. So important to keep that in mind as, you, as we go forward. 
Council also wanted to look at uh, some service problems uh, that we have kind of inherent in our system as it's matured from basically put everything at the curb, you know, 50, 60 years ago in the city to pick everything up and everything went to the landfill till we started adding carts and separation and to where we are today. So here's a couple pictures that we found um, and I, we show this at council, but this is just representative samples. We have a lot of this. Some people have a lot of carts. Um, you see the bottom picture there, there's a whole series of carts from one house. That's an extreme amount of refuge. And, and I, I joke, because when we were going through recently, CNR came through and did an inventory of their carts to make sure they kind of knew what was out in the field. They, they joked with us because we actually have one house in the city that has 75 carts. I'm not gonna say where, but that's a lot of carts and a lot of refuge. We also have this picture up here references a lot of carts to a single house. We've had a lot of changes since we started growing up and when the Charter Amendment was put in place about residential refuge, because we now have a lot of commercial operations in our systems. Think uh, Airbnbs and rental properties that don't act like a normal residence. They have a lot of refuge, have a lot more refuge than a single family residence. We now have uh, group homes uh, within us in the service areas. And, and other properties that generate a lot of uh, material. So that's kind of a burden on the system too. And how do we service these? That was one of the things we wanted to look at. The other thing we had was, uh, again, I mentioned source separation, some of the automation issues. Um, we can't, we're not gonna be picking up stuff on the ground anymore. It's gotta be in the car. That was one of the things we came up with because if you look at this picture uh, up at, here on the left, a lot of people will put in bags. This was a method that worked for years, but what they don't realize is that all this bag trash here goes directly to the landfill. The, the folks who pick up this material aren't sorting on the place and they don't know what's in this material. We don't either. So the default is all this material goes to the landfill and it could be full of recyclables, but we're not gonna stop and do that. Plus it's a lot of manual labor to get, stop the truck. These are side loaders and rear loaders and, and pick all this stuff up. So one of the changes we're gonna be doing is you need to put all this material and sort it in your carts and put it all in the carts. Um, you can have as many carts as you want, but the material has to be in the cart now. Um, if you leave it on the ground like this, um, uh, you either want to call for a bulky atom pickup, which I'll talk about in a minute, or you, you can it'll be a small charge if you want to leave it all on the ground. They're going to have to stop. It costs a lot more to take care of that. And again, that's not part of that uh, charter requirement that the city has a very expensive system or, or, or goes to a point where we have to pick everything up off the ground. Uh, we'll take the trash for free, but the trash needs to now be in a cart. This bottom picture you notice too is is a case where um, with a lot of green stuff in the black cart, and that's that's historic. And now with green carts, we'll be able to capture that material. So that that brings uh, us into more compliance and helps us with the state law mandates. Some of the other problems that we saw, uh, and this is just as we change and hit, without having everything in the cart, you look at this lower system here. This is problematic for the uh, refuge uh, folks who have to pick this up. If it's not in a cart, they have to stop, try to pick all this stuff up and put it manually in a cart. Who knows what this stuff is? But this is pretty typical in some areas and that's not now gonna have to be containerized. Um, and again, what would happen with all that material is it just thrown in the, the landfill cart and it all goes right to the landfill because there's no way that a gentleman's gonna sit there and rip up in these bags and sort all the material. Um, it just doesn't work. It happens at a, a MER from a material processing center, but it doesn't happen on the street. So the requirement is you're gonna have to separate that and then put it in the right carts and it's gonna have to be in a cart. Um, the other thing we found out, we have construction debris. People would be basically remodeling and doing their houses and just throw it all on the curb. And historically, the, the city crews and even CRNR would just pick all this material up. But we're going to change how we pick that up. You're going to need to uh, call for a bulky item pickup now if it doesn't fit in your cart, um, or you could arrange for a dumpster or something else on that. So that's some of the problems we're taking care of. This will also eliminate the problem with when the materials out like that, we have a lot of water quality issues. We have complaints about birds and vectors because of the trash. And when we get windy and rainy days, we really have a mess. The material blows around or uh, it gets contaminated there. So that's something we're going to be fixing too in this new contract. So let's talk about, uh, again, processing this material. We're expanding through a three cart system in, in the city um, and that's going in place now. I've talked about the blue cart will be your dry recyclables, your green cart will be your food waste, your yard waste, and then you'll have again the black cart for everything else. We're gonna increase automation. This requires that all the material needs to go in the cart, be pre-sorted uh, and, and put in that way. And truthfully, most people do this now. We're, we have a pretty good compliance. There are a few people that are gonna have to kind of change their habits and learn the ways, but we're no longer, will just material be left on the ground and picked up. 
Um, you're going to get free consolidated bulky pickups, but it's going to be limited to five a year and five items each. And, and that's pretty, pretty uh, aggressive because some cities, most cities have like three a year for three items, things like that. That's my, my system. The council looked at this and wanted to go on the high side, but that's all within what we think is, is relative under uh, the agreement with the charter that we pick up the general uh, refuge, typical trash, things like that. And then a significant construction remodel projects really don't fit this program. They need to be, if you can get in your car, good, or some of it can go there, but it needs to be directed to a special pickup, a dumpster, bulky item or something, because it's a lot of material. And again, that that goes into the backside of the cost uh, of slowing the system down, uh, a lot of manual labor on the site. And that's really not fair for the, the basic uh, general populace of the city that has to pick up the cost for a few of these occasions. So the cart sizes too, when we get into that, you're gonna have an option to pick your cart size and I'll get a little more detail in the next slide, but here's the three basic sizes. There's a 32, a 64 and a 96. And in some cases, the 64 is going to be the default, particularly in um, uh, the, like the Newport Heights, the Port Streets, uh, Newport Coast. Uh, in other areas, we're really going to be looking at the 32. That would be maybe on the peninsula, Babel Island, those confined areas. Um, you'll probably have to use 32s. You can get any one of these carts. You're going to have the choice. Uh, a lot of people in Newport Coast just want to have a 96 and be done with it. Um, so um, that's going to be your three cart sizes. The program allows you to pick up to the card sizes and have a certain amount of each card. In the black trash area, the default is a 64 gallon, but if you want two 32 gallons or 196, you'll be allowed to do that. Again, at size, you'll have to look at your own properties how you do that. On the recycling side, you could get a 64, you could have two 64s, you could have two 96s, you could have two 32s. Uh, again, what fits your property. And now we have a new green cart that's coming in. And so you'll have a default of a 64 um, if you want a 32. And I think, in, in I would guess in most of the peninsula, Babel Island, you're gonna have um, the 32 carts just because you don't generate that much green waste down in those areas uh, and space constraints might drive it. Up in Newport Coast, they might wanna have the, the 96 gallon. That would be important. Uh, they could, you know, if they're if they're doing the refuge or green waste, or they have a gardener who trims their lawn and he can dump it in there, that's that's fine too. By the way, I did hear it too. When now that we have uh, green carts, that some of you, your your gardening is uh, they're not hauling away your material; they're putting your green cart. You might even find that the price goes down a little, so they don't have to dispose of it anymore because it's it's picked up by your green card city uh, paid card. And then lastly, under the organics program, uh, this last picture here is called a kitchen pail. This is something we're going to be providing to all the residents who want them. Um, we're going to be going around our contractors here and are be coming by and explaining the program, talking about the new carts when they distribute. And they're also be giving you a kitchen pail. This is just an aid for your kitchen. Um, if you want to put your, your uh, green waste in here and then put that in your green cart every week as it goes out, that's fine. I know there's a lot of questions about this. We're happy to help you. I don't think I have the time today, but um, my wife's experiment with, I just got mine in Mission Viejo and, and she's finding ways to use it. There are bags that go in here. You can have decompostable bags. You can't use regular plastic. Plastic, but, re but decompostable bags that you can buy uh, can go in there and line it. Some people put it in there and they freeze it and they throw it out. Uh, some people put their yard waste in and put it on top. So we'll be working through that, but that's a way to capture more of the organics. If, if you choose to use it, you can make your own method too. So let's talk about trash generation for a minute, because this was a big discussion with the working group and how we came up with um, putting uh, some limits on the amount of trash you can put out. Remember, the charter talks about we provide free trash. The attorneys and others took a lot of look at this, and it didn't mean unlimited trash. It meant the typical average family trash that's collected when the charter was put in place, not, not now the group homes and the commercial folks running commercial establishments out of their homes, things like that. That's kind of above and beyond what the original intent was. So what they looked at is, and this chart here shows, currently the average for Newport Beach is about 141 gallons per week. Yeah, when I speak in gallons, that's how carts are measured and things like that, but you can kind of get the feeling of a cart size. And of that right now, um, 81 gallons is basically in the uh, municipal trash can, the black can, and about 60 gallons is in the recycling can. So that's kind of our current profile right now. We project as we put the green can in, you're gonna end up with maybe about 60 still recyclable. I think that's gonna actually go up more, but uh, what's gonna happen is your black can, your waste will go down 62 and some will go in your green can now, 19%. Uh, These are averages again. So they looked at this and said, well, our average is about 141 here. 
what the council decided uh, to do is put a, a much more generous rate on that. This, this is probably in line with a charter, typically which were averages picked up. We, we're going to allow for up to 384 gallons of service a week, which is quite a lot. You know, it's, it's more than doubled, about 2.7 times and almost three times that. So there's still a lot of volume. If, if you're beyond that volume, you probably have to look at how you're doing your refuge. You're either an uh, uh, extraordinary huge property than, and with maybe a lot of green waste or something like that, or uh, you're running an SRO, a short-term rental or something like that, uh, maybe even running a business out of your house or there's construction related. We, we have those issues out there. And, and fairly, you should probably be paying more for that. You shouldn't be on the, the free residential side. So in order to handle that, um, um, they're going to probably have to limit the carts like we talked about, and I showed you the graph before, but you cannot have as many carts as you want, by the way. There's a small service fee if you want for additional carts. It, the, the highest fee is $6 a month. That would be for a black cart, but uh, recycle carts and green carts are less than that. Um, but to give you a sense of the, the volume on this, we put this slide together at no cost. You can have 96 gallons of trash in your black, and that's, that's a lot of trash. You have 192 in your cycles and 96 in your green carts. Again, that's 384 gallons, which is a lot of volume. And I tried to kind of, people ask, gosh, I, I'm trying to get a grasp of that. Think of 77 five-gallon buckets. That's a lot of buckets. You know, that's, that's, that's that kind of volume, 50 cubic yards of waste a week at no cost. That's well beyond what other people provide. And again, most cities don't provide free refuge. Um, the household... Uh, Again, the, there's other services that we're still going to continue in there. Right now, we have a valet service, and it's a paid-for service. We're going to still keep that service. Those are for folks that um, maybe they're gone or they're gone a lot, and they want their trash service. They, there's a standard service and a premium, depending on where it is. They'll bring the guy will get out of the car, bring the cart out, load the carts, and you, you pay a little more for that for that service. Uh, that'll continue. There's also a clause in there if you're certified disabled that will do that for you at no cost. So those services are existing now will continue. Um, additional collection processing things, we're gonna get new collection trucks, which is good. We have uh, an older fleet, CNR is upgrading all that. We're gonna have uh, uh, requirements on that, that no truck is older on the average of uh, uh, old, older than 10 years and an average age of seven years, which is good. We'll have good equipment. That means a lot, it looks well, it operates well, it's reliable and it doesn't drip fluids and things like that with some of the older equipment. Um, and then we're going to institute a new truck. This picture here I'm showing you is called a split body truck. And why we're going this route, this is a specialized truck, and this will be in those confined space areas, Peninsula, Babel Island, maybe Crone Del Mar, uh, some of the alley areas. And what does this do? Because we're adding a green cart, which we're adding another truck route, but we wanted to reduce the amount of trucks going down the alleys and other places. So this truck will pick up two quantities. In this case, it'll probably pick up your black can and your green can in one pass. Those are the, the volumes that'll fit in this. Your highest volume is typically your recycle can, and that'll be the second pass picked up. So this technology is kind of exciting. Um, we have to special build these trucks. We've got them now, they'll be rolling out, um, but that's part of the new contract. And again, we're gonna process our organic material at the least expensive cost. And when we process that, we need to either take it to a, a composting facility. You're probably familiar with that. They basically break it down, turn it over, turn it into a mulch or a compost material. Same kind, kind of things you buy at Home Depot in your compost bags. Or we take it to a digester, which is, is a faster process. They put it into a mechanical process and basically let this material cook up. It breaks down quicker and it comes out the same. You end up with a digested material at the end that can be, all of that can be reused and put in gardens as amendments and things like that. So that's, that's now what's gonna happen with that green material. Um, and then we're lastly gonna have to change some collection days because we are changing the process um, and with the new routes and things like that and the balancing of the routes, we're gonna implement uh, new collection uh, days in a lot of areas. So this, this graph, and I know it's hard to read here, but it's all online. And if you actually wanna look at this in more detail, go to the council uh, report that's in the council agenda for the uh, January 11th meeting. And it has a lot more detail. You can drill down on these maps, but this map just represents our current collections and it's color coded by day. So reds are Monday, uh, blues are Wednesdays, Fridays are green. And you can notice how it's kind of all spread out and it, it's historic how the city kind of built and how we collected. 
we're in areas like this. I look up here at Ford Road up by East Bluff. There's there's four collection routes in here. We're running four different days in that area. And it, it's it just creates a lot of truck traffic. So by looking at our, our new route system and and balancing it, you know, this is the proposed routes we're going to find. You're going to find that it's more organized and the trash refuge trucks are in one area for one day. And then you're not going to see them the other six days. Unlike, like I said, East Bluff and Newport Coast, which has daily collections, are always seeing trucks. Um, that's going to be mean that some people are going to have to change days. Um, not everybody will probably think a little more than 50% of the city will change route days. So again, this is this is another change, and I understand change is uncomfortable, but we're going to move through this. I, it's really not going to hopefully a, a be a big effect. If you had to put it out Tuesday, now you're putting out Wednesday. And you'll be notified that. Let me go back real quick. I, I'm sure I'll have it in a second. I'll show you a, a website you can go to and find that out exactly. But it, it really is necessary um, to make the routes more efficient and less disruptive. Again, I mentioned multiple trucks and neighborhoods on, on multiple days of the week. Now we're just going to have it one day. Um, it also allows us to provide and expand to that three card system. It balances out the loads. One of the areas I, I get a lot of calls, or Mike actually gets a lot of calls, is the peninsula because it's one of our heaviest loads and it's the longest day. And oftentimes the trucks are struggling to finish the routes. They're coming in late at night because there's so much material. Remember, the truck fills up, they have to go back to drop it off at a processing center, come back, collect more. So, and some days are very light, they're, they're done by noon or one. So we're going to balance it out with the routes. That'll make sure that we're picking it up on time. We're not running late or worst cases, it gets skipped. They just, we had recently uh, just after the holidays, some routes had to run double days. People were calling, I didn't get my trash picked up. They ran all day and combined a little COVID on top of that with some driver problems. Um, we had to pick up the next day or the next day. And we don't want your refuge to sit out past your day. So that's one of the reasons. It's going to increase the safety uh, with the number of miles driven dropping and the number of trucks being on the, the route uh, dropping. That's important too. And then uh, it just, again, kind of avoids those high congestion areas at certain times, reduces the noise, a truck emission, some benefits to doing this. So we are gonna change some of your routes. With that too, I'll notice that some of your street sweeping will change as well. We typically like to have our street sweeping follow our the day of our refuge collection. So the day after we try to sweep, and that's just because there is material once all dropped and things like that. And it's nice for the sweeper to kind of pick that up the next day if that's available. It doesn't happen in all cases, but that's what we try to shoot for. So again, we're gonna have some route changes. Um, here's the link on here. If you go to this link, you can actually find your route, you'll find your new day, and they'll be noticing, there'll be proper noticing, you'll know when it's going to come about. It's not all going to happen at once, it's going to be taking place over the next month, roughly. And uh, CRR will notice you, tell you a week or two ahead of time when you change your route, uh, and then start collecting it that way. And so implementation schedule is important. This was just passed by uh, the new residential contract by the council, as I mentioned, January 11th. So we're getting right on this because again, I'm also mentioned state law required us to have this in place January 1, 2022. We're just a little behind, but we are working with the state. They do have some grace period down there. And the good news is we're not at the end of the pack. We're not in the middle pack. We're, we're, we're at complying with the law, we're getting in there, but we do need to get this rolled out. So what you're going to see now is the new green organic cans are going to start being brought out in February and March. Those have been ordered. They're starting to come in. They'll bring those out. They'll have a knock, knock, talk about kitchen pails, give you information on that. Um, and as they deliver those cans, we'll start the pickup once you get it the next week. And that's when we're looking to now move your organics from your black can to your green can. In the meantime, if you only have a black can and not a green can, just keep putting your organics in your black can. It's just going to be uh, part of the transition until all the cans are rolled out. And then for those extra service things that you want, let's say you're somebody who has a lot of, you're running an SRO, a short-term residential uh, rental or something like that, and you have a lot of extra trash, you need more cans, the, the service charges for those will start in April. So again, there's small service charges, but if you need, uh, let's say black cans, you need five black cans and, and we're giving you two large cans, then you'll need to pay a small upcharge for those extra three cans. That's part of the process uh, to kind of uh, take care of that overburden in some areas. Again, if you're running construction or something like that, we're really gonna encourage you to, to get a dumpster or if you're remodels, things like that. Uh, or if you want to stack it all up and call for a large bulky item pickup, you again will get five free of those a year and have that material moved out. You can do that too. So 
Um, we have a lot of education going on this. You're going to see we're talking at we bring right here. We've been doing outreach. We've been on Facebook and digital uh, Twitter. We've done direct mailings. You received a recycle guide now that kind of gives you some information on how to recycle and use your green cards. When those green cards come out, actually CNR in their contract, they're going to have people going door to door to help residents understand what goes where, answering questions, things like that. Um, we've got displays if you actually want to see the cans. We put cans out at the community center. They're out at Marina Park um, and various of the libraries have them if you want to kind of see if you want to and working towards that. Again, the cans have a chart next to them kind of tells you what goes in and we'll be giving you more information on that as we go along. And we're happy to come out and talk to any community groups if you're actually one of those um, and you want us to come out, we'll arrange that and talk to your folks. Um, and upcoming again, we're going to keep talking about, we're going to keep bringing out more material on organics and, and recycling just to, to help change that habit. It's, it's not a huge change. It's going to take a little work. Um, it's not uh, the way we used to do it, but it's, it's definitely better. It's going to create a cleaner city, uh, better recycling efforts, better for our environment, uh, reduce a lot of truck trips and how we do things and, and just better overall for, for our city and in our environment. So that's kind of where we're heading on that. Last thing to know, I have this slide here, just things you need to know. Again, sort out those drawer right recyclables and put them in your blue cards. Now's the time to do it. Everybody now has a blue card, so let's start getting in that habit. And a yes, uh, with our change in the way we process our uh, economy in terms of shipping now, we have a lot of Amazon boxes or other delivery boxes Walmart. Um, those boxes need to be cut, broken down, and put them in your blue card. And I know that I find that because my wife orders a lot. And I'm, I've got a lot more boxes than I used to have, but they all fit in your blue card. You have to just take a little more time. That's kind of change in how we, uh, as a society, are now getting our material. Um, you want to uh, make sure you take all the material and get it in a card. And don't leave it on the ground anymore because that's going to be uh, eventually going to create a problem and they're gonna to have to talk to you about getting in the cart or you're gonna end up paying a small fee to have it lay on the ground and have it manually collected. Um, again, you get large bulky item pickups. If you have a, a, once in a while that big furniture or five items or you have a bunch of construction material you want to remove, you can call these numbers and, and get that arranged for. Um, and then again, you're gonna get your green, green card soon. Um, put everything in your black card until you get your green card and then start putting your green material, Your yard waste, your leaves, your uh, any kind of organic material and your food waste go in there. Um, and then lastly, again, I leave these numbers with you and you can look at this and they're on the council presentation too. Uh, for if you have any questions, these numbers are CRNR directly. We encourage you to call CRNR. That's the fastest way to do it. They have people on standby. They actually set up a dedicated Newport line now for our new contract. Um, but if you have any problems with CRNR or can't get the service you need, please call this last number, which is a city number, and we'll intervene and help you on that. And I apologize for speeding through this. I know it's a lot of material, but uh, I thank you for your time. We'll take questions now. Um, and uh, I think I'll turn it back over. I'm going to stop sharing here and we'll go to questions. So um, you're past your hard stop at 830. I don't know if you need to leave. We're more than happy. Oh, I'm, I, I do need to leave, but uh, <laughs> Maybe I, it's, it's, there's no easy way out of it. It's a big program. Mike, do you mind staying while I leave? I'm sorry to leave that on you. I do have another meeting. I apologize, folks. I'd love to talk to you. You need your uh, unmute, you, Micah. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you, Mike. Are you good to go? Yeah, I'm good to go, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Whoops. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry to run off. Another commitment. No, no worries. Thank you. That was a great uh, comprehensive um, report on the new program. So we do have some questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll start uh, maybe with, whoops, we lost Micah there. Uh, hopefully he'll be back. Uh, well, we got Alberta. There we go, Micah's coming back. Okay, Micah, don't forget to unmute your, uh, your screen. So we do have some uh, questions here in the Q&A box. Um, so I'll start out with those and I've got a list of about six or seven of my own questions uh, to ask about this program. I'm sure Alberto has a couple as well. So uh, first off, um, Jim Moser here, he's actually has three questions in the Q&A. Um, Jim's very good about <laughs> questioning city programs. And uh, uh, I think some of these are, are kind of important to be answered. So first off, he says uh, the new contract serves 24,000 homes in Newport Beach. According to the uh, council staff report on January 11th, nearly half, almost 10,000, are regarded as receiving standard valet service, which uh, each home will be billed an uh, $8.30 a month charge uh, extra. 
or well, they're, they're getting it free now, so it's not extra, but uh, they'll be paying that. Where are these homes and who will send out the new bill? And what is their option to receive free trash pickup the city is supposed to provide? So um, good question on the valet cart service. So CRNR offers what's called valet service. If you would like to have them come and get your carts from behind your gate or next to your house, pull them out further into the alley or out to the street for you. That's a service they do provide. And there is a fee for that. And you could sign up for that. And the standard valley service is more for um, space constrained neighborhoods like the peninsula and the island. And that's where there's parking in the alley or areas where, you know, if you were to roll the carts all the way out to the truck, they'd be in the middle of the alley. So the driver gets out and moves the carts over to where they could service them. That's included. That's not charged for but if you want that additional, what we call premium valley service, where they roll it from the side of your house or behind the gate, that's, that's something that's charged for. And CRNR bills directly for that. But that's an optional service that the resident can choose to have and can sign up for. And who's going to send the bill out? Is that CRNR or is that a city bill? Yeah, CRNR would bill for that directly. So not the city. And um, he, his last question there was what's the option to receive free trash pickup? So you're supposed to provide, I guess Dave talked about that. And uh, I guess the analysis of the charter was that the, the service is free up to a limit. And um, which in fairness, you know, I was on city council for nine years and I was there when we sort of transitioned to the, to the uh, uh, contract out that service. And at the time the council did say, you know, it's gonna be exactly the same as what we're doing now. Um, you know, nothing's gonna change. Um, and so this is a change. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad change. I think it's actually a great change. Um, instead of having 50 different types of trash barrels in our alleyway, we have, you know, standardized thing. The lids aren't flying everywhere. And so, you know, it's a lot cleaner. Most people put their trash in the trash receptacle instead of leaving bags uh, like some of those pictures. So I think it's been a much better system, but clearly the service is different um, than what we were used to back in, you know, before we, you know, contracted it out, we had our own city employees. I mean, they literally would pick up everything, anything that you put out there and they dump it in. And, and so it is a little bit different, but, you know, times change and we need to change with them. So maybe we'll go to, uh, Jim's got several questions, but maybe we'll try and get some of the others first. So Chaz uh, Freed, I think, or Fried says, how does the new system work in a residential multi-story condo building using chutes for trash for residents? And also, for single family residences, are the compost containers to be provided by the city to be lined with plastic or something uh, to avoid attracting animals and insects? Okay, so first on the uh, multifamily residential units, so like apartment complexes and things like that, those are handled through commercial accounts. So as a lot of you are aware, the city is on an open commercial franchise system. So we don't have an exclusive service that's, that's one size fits all. We have standard residential collection for single family homes, and then multifamily complexes are handled on commercial contracts. So whoever the owner of the property is would contract that service with a commercial service provider. And that service provider has a multitude of variations on how they could provide the service, whether through it's a cart system or a bin service, however they wanna do that. Um, our role in the city is to make sure that whatever program they are providing is in compliance and we just make sure that they're meeting the state mandates. But depending on who the service provider is and the owner of the complex, what service they decide best fits the need, um, you may see some differences there. And then with regards to the organics um, kitchen pail or the cart, um, the, the pail is optional, but if you choose to use that, you can line it with what's called a compostable bag. So the bag is, um, it, it looks green, it has certified compostable on the packaging. You can order them on Amazon. They're available online, they're available at most grocery stores or other places like that. And if you prefer to line your, your kitchen pail with those, you can certainly do that. And you can tie that bag up and throw it in your organics cart if you know mess or smell is a concern for you. So that's certainly an option on how to manage that. There are other ways of you know handling the, the waste inside your green cart. You can layer it with leaves and grass and things like that to kind of help so it's not so compounded, but there are different options there in the kitchen pail. Again, it's optional, but it's certainly a tool to help manage that more efficiently uh, with the compostable bags. Yeah, I did realize that there were compostable bags. I know that's a question my wife said, like, I don't want to throw 
you know, food scraps right directly into the trash container because that's going to create smell and other things. But so apparently there is a way to at least prevent that. <clears throat> I, just as a follow up to Chaz's question, because so we talked about single family residences and we've talked about maybe larger buildings that have 10, 20, 30 units in it that has a commercial hauler that's taking their trash away. What I mean, the residential service though goes, I know I own a duplex and the city picks that up. What, how many units will the city pick up is the city picking up too? Is it like a fourplex or what is it? Yeah, it's typically done by parcel. So depending on how many units are on that parcel, right? So, you know, I think up to a fourplex is, you know, city collection, anything larger than that, when it becomes a multi-complex, then that's required to have the commercial service. It really comes down to accessibility. Can we get in there with a truck and get, you know, curbside collection or alley collection with carts? If we can't, then obviously bins are the other option, and that has to be done through the commercial service. Yeah, because the city's not picking up any trash dumpsters, right? At, That's correct. At larger yeah. commercial buildings. Okay. Alberta, do you have any something burning question you want to ask while I sit through a form? More of these? Well, let's let's see what uh, we have here. Um, Pierre Schwann has a series of questions. <laughs> so let me see if we can uh, go through them pretty quick. Uh, explain the insert can for food waste better and how it works. I think you covered that. Uh, how much of the non-food waste recycle is actually recycled? If not much, then why are we doing this? So um, I guess to answer that, you know, it all depends on how much you're source separating, right? We're going to a source separation system. That's why we have the three carts now as opposed to the single bin or the two carts. So putting as much dry, clean recyclables as you can into the blue cart, the more material you put in there, the more that's recycled. It's up, it's up to the homeowner to be exclusive with how they're sorting that and putting it into the bins. We want to minimize the amount of um, recyclable material that's going into that black cart. And then any organic waste, you know, like we talked about food scraps, green waste, yard waste, that stuff needs to go into the green card. So the better the resident gets at source separating, the more recyclables we'll be able to recover and the better it will be processed. Well, I, I think maybe what peers um, are trying to get at is, and I've heard this anecdotally, I don't know if it's true or not, but a lot of the stuff that we send to be recycled doesn't actually get recycled because, you know, there's not a market for it, like cardboard. Um, or newsprint or even plastics that, you know, that we separate it and it's supposed to be recycled, but ultimately it winds up in the dump because they don't have a, uh, anybody to, to purchase those materials. It's, can you enlighten us on that? Yeah, so, you know, those recyclable products, once they you know, get to the processing facility, they're sorted even further and to the different, what's called a commodity, right? The number one plastics, number five plastics, cardboard, paper, those are all sorted in and packaged up as commodities. And then it's all market driven. So depending on how the market's doing with, re with regards to the demand of those type of products and their resale value um, kind of controls, you know, how much of that is, is indeed being made a commodity and being sold off for, you know, being turned into other things. Or if the market's low and there's not a lot of um, demand for that product, and sometimes it does end up making its way back to the landfill. But it all depends on the service provider, right? So CRNR, our contractor, you know how well they are at working through that market and finding buyers for their product and, and what's done with that product. That's kind of the end result of this effort. So as from the city's responsibility, we just need to make sure we have a service provider that is managing this market-driven commodities, recyclable content stuff the best that they can. And you know, so that all fluctuate, ebb and flow, obviously, but the, the goal is to always explore what those options are and where the demands are for, for the highest resale value. Um, anonymous attendees asking here, when and how will we get the carts? I think you talked about when, sort of, but how will they get the new carts? And, and like, quite frankly, I have more carts now than probably what's allowed. I don't really want to pay for the extra cart. So how are those carts going to be returned um, to CRNR? And what are they going to do with those carts after they get them back? Are those going to go to the landfill? Yeah, so there, there's a, a few different phases to our rollout plan. And most of you should have already received your blue carts. And if you don't, please call CRNR and request that. The, the goal was to try to have all those distributed at this point. And then really what's left is the uh, green top carts. And those will start rolling out 
in uh, February and March. Um, and then there is going to so, be so they'll just automatically be delivered to you. You don't have to request. Them. Yeah, and there'll be some communication coming out to each neighborhood, you know, because it's it's phased by neighborhood. You'll receive some outreach material telling you when that cart's going to be coming and what to do with it when it gets there. And they don't want to deliver the carts until they're ready to start collecting them, right? So that's why it's kind of phased in. But you'll get some communication from CRNR and from the city telling you when your green cart will be arriving and what to expect. And then there's also what we call the right sizing phase, where the homeowner is going to have an opportunity to kind of, you know, reallocate, reassess their needs. And if you have additional carts that you just don't want, that you don't need, um, you could call CRNR to have those picked up and they'll pick them up and they'll be redistributed in other areas or, you know, other contracts, other cities even. But um, the goal is to, to continue to repurpose those for their useful life. So if I, for instance, have <clears throat> five of the little um, carts at my home and now I'm only allowed to have two, I think under the new program, without having to pay for the extra three, um, if I don't call CRNR, then they're going to start charging me for those three extra carts or... How does that work? Yeah, so CRNR is doing a car audit and they'll they'll reach out to you at some point. If, if you haven't reached out to them already, they'll reach out to you and they'll say, our records indicate that you have X number of carts and X number of sizes. And mm -hmm. according to, to our records, if you continue to desire to have this number of carts, then your, your fee could potentially be X number of dollars, depending on the, the additional number of carts you have above the standard service, right? So um, they'll, they'll be giving you an opportunity to decide um, if you want to pay for those additional carts or if you want to offload some of them or if you want to ask for more carts you'll be given an opportunity to do that before you're being charged okay you know uh mike i think carmen has a really good question because folks uh who have these uh new cans uh stand at the trash can in their kitchen wondering what do i put where Right, so she asked the question um, about Cheeto bags or Dorito bags, or you know, they're they seem plastic, uh, but what are they? So uh, she's getting questions or answers that are point or pointing her in both directions. So maybe could you just cover a few household items that uh, and yeah. where they go? The the best rule of thumb, Alberto and and everyone else is to you know look at the packaging. If it has a recyclable logo on it with the three arrows and a number, that's definitely recyclable. That's the telltale sign that this is a recyclable product. And so that's always kind of the default rule of thumb. Look for that logo. If you're unsure, look for that. And if you don't find it, then just put it in the trash. But if it's recyclable, it should be there. Now there are exceptions to some of that, you know, like bubble wrap material from Amazon boxes and um, different cardboard packaging doesn't always have that logo on it, but we all know cardboard is recyclable, so you could put cardboard in there and that plastic wrap stuff you could put in there. So it won't always have that logo, but that's a good rule of thumb to start with. And as we get more, you know, involved in this program, we'll all start to understand a little bit better what could be put in there. But you could also call CRNR and ask them the question directly, and they could certainly probably answer even better than I can about what they accept and what they don't. Um, so if you have a, an item that you're consistently producing that you just don't know what to do with, you could always call CRNR and ask them what to do with that product. And they could help guide you a little bit, a little bit more um, specifically. Um, I have a question that I've been wondering about. So how is this all going to be enforced? I mean, I've talked to some of my neighbors or told them, hey, you know, on trash day, we're all out there moving our cans around. I said, you know, the city's changing the system and they're going to you're going to have an organics waste cart now and you have to you know, separate all this stuff out and they're not going to pick up your stuff on on the ground anymore. And and, you know, some of them come back. Well, I'm just going to throw all, all the trash in whatever cart I want to throw it. In. So how is how are you actually going to enforce this? How are you going to make sure that, you know, the three carts are being used properly um, by these homes? Is someone going to go up and down the alleys looking in your trash can or, you know, what's the yeah, so mechanism? So we rely on the waste hauler to, you know, kind of do audits of their collection. And if they find that there's consistent contamination in the carts, meaning that the wrong stuff is in the wrong cart um, on any of their routes, 
then we'll narrow down that route and our recycling coordinators will go cart to cart and lid flip, we call lid flipping, and they'll look inside the car and make sure the right type of stuff is in there. And that's how we narrow down where the contamination is coming from and how we're not achieving our diversion. And then we'll work with the resident or the homeowner about that. And it's, it's more outreach and education driven. We want to educate everyone and provide them the right outreach and material to understand the importance of it, why it's necessary, why we do it. Um, there is an enforcement into this on the very back end, but our goal and objective is to, to work with the community on an outreach and education level and, and really try to help them understand how to use the program and make sure that they're able to achieve what, what the intent is and then um, work from there. But if we have people who just consistently don't want to follow it or, or are just arbitrarily throwing stuff in there because they don't want to take the time to do it, then we'll have to you know, spend a little bit more time with them and, and it may lead to enforcement. But um, that's certainly not the goal. We don't want to have an enforcement approach to this. We want to have an outreach and education approach. So we'll definitely have staff either from the city side or CRNR to provide that outreach and education as necessary. But if everyone's successful at source separating like they should, um, hopefully that's not even needed. So that's the intent. You're very, uh, Alberto, I saw your message. I know you have to leave. Maybe you want to say your advice. I, I think we still have some, if Mike has some more time, we have some more questions. Yeah, thanks. Out. Thanks, Micah. This has been very informative. I'm sorry, I've got to run to another meeting, but uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Alberta. So just to follow up on your answer, so does the new program actually have monetary penalties that ultimately could be enforced against a homeowner if they don't comply? Or is it just... Ultimately, yes. And, and you know, that also applies to like the containerization thing we talked about. Like if you have bag trash, and you're just setting it on the ground next to your cart, CRNR is going to pick it up anyway, because we don't want to leave trash behind, right? We're going to pick that up, but there'll be an education level to that. And they'll start charging for that extra collection. If, if they're having to pick up that bag trash consistently, they'll start charging you for it. And then if they charge you over a certain number of times and you're still not doing it, then, then the city will come in with enforcement behind that through our municipal code. So um, it's progressive, you know, the, the fee will get higher and the, the the citation will get more expensive um, until compliance is met. But again, we, we don't want it to come to that. We want to be able to work with the, the homeowner and the community on, on the educational aspect of this and helping them to uh, you know, work through the program through its um, intended purpose. So, um, so people are supposed to um, you know, separate things out and whatever, but what happens if you know, recyclables do wind up like people put their uh, used uh, water bottles, for instance, um, in the in the regular trash, is there going to be no separation at all? Is it just going straight to the dump, or will it still be taken to, I guess, a, a MRF or dirty MRF or whatever, and whatever recyclables are in there, still an intent will be made to take those out. Like Dave mentioned earlier, the dirty MRF is going away, so the 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 sorting of that black cart is no longer going to be an option and available to us. So whatever's in the black cart is going to go straight to the landfill. Mm -hmm. Whatever's in the blue cart is going to go to the recycling processing facility, and whatever's in the green cart is going to go to the composting facility. So there's three distinct separate waste streams now, um, all going to a separate place. So whatever goes in your black cart is going to go to the dump. It's going to go to the landfill. So that's why it's really important that we have those other cart options available, and we try to separate as much as we can to, to reduce the amount that's going in. And uh, it was also mentioned in the presentation that there'll be um... Uh, five, up to five bulky item pickups a year uh, and up to five items per pickup. Um, what about things like hazardous waste pickups and e-waste pickups? Yeah, so um, CRNR will continue to do free doorstop collection is what we call it. So if you have household hazardous waste, e-waste, um, if you have sharps for, for medical purposes, all those things they'll pick up from your doorstop free of charge. And all you have to do is call CRNR to schedule that and they'll take care of that. Um, and that's as many times as needed. The bulky item stuff is a, you know, much more um, you know, difficult to deal with. So that's why we put some limitations on that. But yeah, five collections a year, and that's a lot higher than all the other cities in the county. Most of these are about three collections. So we were offering five and up to five items there. And that includes you know, items like furniture, chairs, you know, um, really large items, hot water heaters, things like that, that need to be taken care of that won't fit in your carts. And then even beyond that five, you could still have more, you'll just have to pay for those. Um, but you know, you could continue to schedule bulky item pickups as needed.
Okay, and, and then I have another personal question, I guess, but it applies to a lot of uh, people in town. So I own a duplex. And uh, so obviously that's two units, two households. Do I get two sets of carts, one for each unit? Um, so it, it's by parcel. So you'll get a, a set of carts for the, for the parcel. So, oh, well, that's interesting. Because, well, that's gonna get expensive for a lot of uh, people <laughs> who own apartments in town now. Yeah, well, again, you know, the, the amount of trash that's being offered up to 96 gallons of, of each waste stream is, is you know, um, has been decided to be a, a efficient enough or enough to, to provide, you know, the standard level of service like we did through our, our waste characterization study. 141, you know, gallons is above average. So 96 seems to fit in where, where we need it to be. But those additional carts, it's a nominal fee. It's about, you know, $9 per cart per Per month. So um, if you need an additional card or two, it's not overly expensive. It's certainly cheaper than what the rest of the cities in the, in the county are paying. Hmm. Okay, well, I, I think that's a little hidden, hidden gem that most people, especially, um, you know, owners of duplexes or up to fourplexes, I guess. Because I mean, if you have four units, a 96 gallon card is not going to cut it. I don't, you know, survey or not. So that'll be- Yeah, and you know, and, and Steve, you know, CRNR with their sustainability team, they'll, they'll work with you on that. And if there's a way to divide that parcel up as to, you know, two standard units instead of the four, there, there's different ways to do that. And if it's, you know, overly burdensome or an issue, we do handle things on a case by case basis. So we, it's more important that we evaluate the need of the property and try to provide, you know, and accommodate them the best possible. So, you know, what I, the scenario I gave you is the standard rule of thumb, but there can be, um, you know, occasions where exceptions may need to be made and we could certainly look at those. Okay. Um, Jim Mosier had another question here. Some people prefer several small carts instead of large, one large one, which you do have some options there on that chart that we saw. Uh, we've been told that people could at no additional charge continue to request for any combination of sizes they wanted up to the maximum allowed volume. But the presentation to council on January 11th and, the, and the, actually the chart that was shown um, indicate that city pay choices will actually be very limited for, for example, just one free organics cart regardless of size, which is correct. Well, so you're allowed up to the 96 gallons, right? So if you want 96 gallons worth of organic waste, then you could, you could have a 96 gallon cart. But if you don't think you're going to produce that much and you want something smaller, then smaller options are available. And same with the black waste. And the, and the blue carts. And the blue carts, we actually offer up to two 96 gallon carts because we're encouraging folks to recycle mm -hmm. and put as much of that material and product into the, the, the um, recoverable waste stream. So that option is much more expansive, but with the black waste cart and the green waste cart, it's up to 96 gallons. So if you want you know, the 32 gallon size, you can have two of those. If you want a 64 and a 32, there's, there's different options and configurations there. And that's to really try to accommodate the specific needs of the property, right? So if you only have space for 32 gallon carts, you can still have those, but it's up to the 96 gallons. So whatever um, car configuration you use to achieve that, um, that's that's up to you to decide. Okay, well, in fairness, I mean, I looked at that chart and I didn't think that that was, I mean, I sort of agree with Jim here and that it looked like, like you could have two six, like you could have um, uh, on the organics, you could have one, one 32, 164, 196. I didn't realize you could have three 32 gallon organics carts. Is that? Yeah, it's, is that? I, I think the chart shows it's 96 up to two 32 gallons or a 64. So well, two I, 30, that's 64, yeah, that's yeah, not 96. Yeah. No. So, right. yeah. so depending on the size cart you want, you may not get the full 96 gallons of each. That's correct, each. that's correct, yeah. Okay, um, Jim also said the city's providing widely different descriptions of what goes in what cart. For example, my newly delivered blue top recycling cart says on its lid that I'm supposed to put textile shoes and plastic grocery bags in it, but the city website says all of those go in the black top trash cart, which is correct, and how are residents to know which to believe? Yeah, so, you know, we'll get better at communicating this. Like I, like I tried to explain earlier, there's a lot of intricacies to, you know, what's recyclable and what isn't. So, you know, on our website, we're trying to keep it simple, um, not to, you know, make it too complex. Um, CRNR actually will go into further detail because they, they know a lot, lot better about what they will process and what they won't. 
So again, if there's a question and you're just not sure, reach out to CNR and they can let you know. As we continue to work through this process and get better with our outreach and communication, we, we plan to be able to make it much more consistent on exactly what, what's in there and what isn't. But um, right now we're, you know, we're still working through that. So again, if there's a question and you're just not sure, call CNR and they'll, they'll be glad to explain that for you. Okay, um, Dorothy Larson's asking, can we get copies of the slides? Is that presentation freely available? I mean, if you emailed it to us, can we provide it to uh, people who wanted it? Yeah, and the um, presentation that was given at council, that's available online too with the staff report. Oh, great, okay. And we've also been recording this meeting and we'll have it up on our website uh, for people who wanna come back and, and review it again. Um, I think that's about all we have time for. It's uh, 10 after nine right now. I appreciate um, you uh, coming um, onto our program this morning and explaining the, the system. I mean, I certainly found out a few new things that I wasn't aware of, of and uh, um, I'll have to um, you know, review our, our use of the carts and especially with my rental properties. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we have a smooth transition, and most people, you know, comply uh, without um, ultimate enforcement, as uh, as you pointed out. So thanks again. Uh, we do have uh, several uh, legislative representatives um, on the call this morning that uh, are available to give uh, quick updates on things that their electeds are doing. So I'm as uh, we'll go through them, and I will promote them to the panelists so that they can give. Let's try to keep it to a couple minutes since we are uh, running a little bit long. So I'm going to go first to uh, Kim Vandermolen with uh, Congresswoman Steele's office, and uh, she should be able to be seen in just a second here. You there, Kim. There she comes. Yes. Good, Good morning. morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I just want to share, I know we are short on time. So just a quick update. Um, I actually have a document that I shared with you, Steve, and maybe we can get that out to anyone that's interested. Um, it's basically just a year in review what the Congresswoman did for you um, as your as your member of Congress in Washington, what we did here in the district office. I just want to quickly go over a few things. Um, in the district office, of course, we um, do constituent services. We contact federal agencies on your behalf um, and we returned over $6.7 million to constituents in the districts from uh, different federal agencies, including the IRS and the Small Business Administration. Um, and then in Washington, the Congresswoman um, introduced 13 bills, um, all, all that had to do with um, the supply chain crisis, um, stopping wasteful spending and expanding telehealth access. Um, and then she did co-sponsor 135 um, bills and 79 of those um, were with bipartisan support. So she's very proud of working across the aisle. Um, we know that's, you know, our government is uh, meant to um, it's hard to get things through unless you work with the other side and the Congresswoman is very, very aware of that. So that's important to her. Um, and I did wanna share quickly, um, March is Women's History Month. And so the Congresswoman is honoring um, several women in the 48th district. Um, we're calling it the Women of Distinction Awards. So if you know of a woman that is deserving of this, um, we are gonna have a page on the website, but I can share my information and email me. Um, and we will nominate um, up to 20 individuals. So we're very excited to do that and honor the hard work working women in the district. So unless anyone else has any questions, I can share my information and um, thank you so much. Yeah, just put it in the chat and um, I'm gonna move on to Matt Kern with uh, State Senator Dave Min's office. With us in just a sec. Here he comes. Morning, Matt. All good, Steve? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, uh, just a super quick update. Uh, the um, Senate is uh, just uh, getting rolling right now. They're working on uh, two-year bills that are introduced into the House last year. Um, once this process is over, right around then, we'll be introducing our legislative package for the year. We were able to get, uh, or the Senator was able to get uh, eight bills chaptered last year. So we're looking to um, improve, off, improve on that, but I think that's a pretty good number. 
Um, we're also working hard to uh, end offshore drilling off Orange County. So um, specifically for Newport Beach, that affects a lot of uh, businesses around there. Look for that bill to be introduced in our package. And as always, we are happy to uh, continue working with the city of Newport Beach and the business community. So reach out if uh, there's anything we can do to help. Great, thank you, Matt. That was quite concise. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, Samuel Turley. I'm gonna get Samuel here promoted. And uh, if he's still with us, oh, looks like Samuel's gone. And last but not least, um, Sergio. Yeah, Sergio Prince is with us. He's actually with um, uh, Supervisor Lisa Bartlett's office, who has not traditionally been one of our um, representatives, but with the new um, redistricting, um, we'll be pushed into District 5, and uh, District 5 will be um, the, the new representative elected uh, in November will be our representative. But Sergio, do you have uh, some things you want to share with us this morning? Well, I'll keep it short and sweet. First of all, I'll, first of all I want to say it's great to see you, Steve. Yeah. Having uh, many conversations on the phone, so it's great to, to see you. And, uh, and I want to thank Dave and Mika for a very informative presentation, really outstanding stuff. Um, but um, as you just mentioned, uh, due to redistricting, you know, the, the uh, configuration of all the supervisorial districts have changed. And we lost Mission Viejo, Lake Forest, and Rancho Santa Margarita. But we gained all of Newport Beach, all of Costa Mesa, and the area of Irvine west of the 405 freeway and the um, Irvine Spectrum um, Entertainment Center within the El Toro Y. And uh, <clears throat> there was a time actually a, a long time ago when the entirety of Newport Beach was in the fifth district. So mm -hmm. you've kind of come full circle. But that being said, I do have a statement from the supervisor, which um, I would like to uh, read. By now, you may be aware that effective January 6, 2022, the new boundaries for the Orange County 5th Supervisorial District took effect following the redistricting process. While I will continue to represent the majority of South County cities and unincorporated communities, the cities of Lake Forest, Mission Viejo, and RSM will now be within the boundaries of the new 3rd District. Furthermore, joining the 5th District will be the cities of Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, and portions of Irvine. Um, to, uh, um, to the residents of Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, and Irvine, welcome to the fabulous 5th District. I'm excited and privileged to serve as your representative, and my team and I are eager to be a resource and advocate for your needs. To ensure a seamless and smooth transition, I am committed to collaborating with your former supervisor on existing and ongoing projects that best serve the residents of the community, as I will work hard to represent your interests and priorities. And um, one of the things that I do for the office is I produce a weekly e-newsletter, has a very robust distribution. And um, I'm going to put my contact information in the uh, chat. Um, if you ever need anything from me or our office, please don't hesitate to reach out. If you'd like to sign up to receive our newsletter, um, you could do so um, through our website or um, you could just reach out to me and I'll be happy to sign you up. So um, I'll have more stuff later on, but that's it for now. Great, thank you, Sergio. And um, we're um, talking back and forth about maybe having uh, Lisa come and either be a speaker here at our Government Affairs Committee meeting or possibly our Wake Up Newport meeting um, in May. So we look forward to hearing from her. I wasn't aware actually, uh, my bad, that uh, she actually was now considered the supervisor for our district. I thought the old district line still applied until the new election, but I'm glad to uh, be informed about that. So um, with that uh, being said, uh, that's the end of our program. We ran a little bit long this morning, but um, I thought because of the importance of the presentation on the trash rollout, I know there's a lot of questions. I, you know, I, I probably have a few more questions that I'm gonna call these guys about, but certainly uh, reach out to uh, the city staff if you have any questions concerning your own individual properties. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to this thing. And, Honestly, I think that they'll probably be working out some um, naughty you know, problems here as this uh, program is uh, put into place. I mean, we have, as it said, 24,000 um, homes and uh, certainly it's not cookie cutter in this community by any stretch. You know, whether you look at, you know, looking at places uh, like Newport Coast down to the uh, places like on Balboa Island where you can barely get a trash truck down those some of those alleys. So um, it'll probably be a, a lot of, um, air pulling and uh, hopefully uh, you know after a few months we'll have a smooth transition i want to thank you all for coming we will we as i said did record the program we will have it up on our 
website, um, our YouTube channel, or our website at newportbeach.com. Uh, we have a lot of other great programs coming up. Our Wake Up Newport meetings are first Thursday of every month. Our networking luncheons are the third Wednesday of every month. And our sunset mixers are the fourth Thursdays of every month. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, it looks like this uh, COVID situation is getting a little bit under control and the numbers are starting to plateau and even decline in some respects. And that by February and certainly by March, we'll be back to meeting in person. So with that being said, have a great uh, day and uh, weekend to come. And we'll see you at uh, our next meeting. And if you're not a member of the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce, you should be. So take care, everybody.